Senator Rice. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm interested in following up that, that same issue in terms of those um, the timeliness of applications being assessed. So you said that if the 2011-2014 applications had been assessed according to the current rules without stopping the clock, um, they would only have been 30 to 35 per cent. What, how about in the period between, 20, say, 2014 to 2016, what, has, what was the timeliness during that period of time? OK. Um, I, I think that's well reported in relation to... I haven't got all those numbers with me at the moment. I do have some, and I could read a lot out, but that time frame performance has fluctuated anywhere from where it currently is at the moment um, in relation to pesticides was 30% in the, in yep. the final quarter, and it was... I'm, 54% for veterinary medicines in that previous quarter. Um, pesticides would have peaked at around about 84% in the September quarter of last year. So September 2016, what, 84%? 83% for, for can you, products. Can you, can you read out some figures? Cause, yep. So since the legislation changed, so tell us, I mean, just the total. Um, so under, in the last quarter, we had the total um, Applications in terms of time frame, I understand, were for, was 42 per cent. That's correct, so 42 per cent. So you could tell us what the trend has been in that over that period of time. Yep. I'll just take one moment to go back. I, I can go back to September 15 yep. quarter. Um, products in that quarter were 63 per cent. December 15 quarter was 65%. Mm -hmm. March 16 was 58%. The June 16 quarter was 78%. The September 16 quarter was 83%. The December 16 quarter was 69%. And as you mentioned, this final March quarter was 42%. Right. So we've had generally sort of in those couple of years, so sort of in the sort of 60s, 70s, 80s, so, so the last quarter dropping down to 42 is quite a significant reduction in timeliness over that period of time. You'd agree with that? That's correct observation. Yes. And, and your summary in the quarterly report said, you know, time frame performance dropped in the March quarter 2017 as the agency increased its focus on addressing overdue applications, particularly in the pesticides area. This is likely to continue into future quarters as the agency continues to prioritise work on the applications which are overdue. So you, you don't expect that that timeliness is going to increase, it's going to improve. Okay, currently at the moment in relation to our overdue applications, we're currently at around about 30% of our applications are actually past their legislative time frame at this point in time. So as we continue to focus on those applications, it will have an impact on our performance time frame because they're already overdue. Right, so they're not going to get... So basically, they, you, you're not measuring how far overdue they are. You just, they fall into the overdue category. Yeah. Mm. The, yes. current, the current trend this quarter is that we're holding steady with where we were in the previous quarter. Right, so you'd expect that you'd be still sitting around that underneath less than half of your applications being processed in a timely manner. For pesticides, yes. Um, veterinary medicines, um, perhaps not. Yes, but overall, so the, with that, you know, your total in this last quarter that you reported was 42%. So you're not expecting that to improve in the next in the next quarter or in the foreseeable the, future. There's, there's still another month to go in relation to this quarter, so I, I wouldn't want to predict one way or the other at this point in time. But your expectation is that it's not going to improve. Though. <coughs> that's what you're, that's what I hear you saying. Is that correct? It's, it's going to depend upon what applications we finalise in this quarter. Yes, but it would be a remarkable turnaround <coughs> if you managed to get it back up above the 50% mark. It, it's not going to jump to 70%. No, and so it's not going to get, jump to the levels that we were experienced over um, 15 and 16 of being you know, well above 50 up into the 60s and even hitting the, the high point of 83%. Not while we focus on getting rid of overdue applications which are right. before us. And you said before that um, staff vacancies, you know, quite understandably, are impacting upon those. Is a is a significant factor in those delays. 
with any vacancy that any agency would have in relation to its staff, it has an impact on its... Yes. Um, just, so staff vacancies are certainly a factor, yes? They have been a factor and we're recruiting to replace those yes. positions. And is the staff vacancies largely amongst the regulatory scientist mix that are the key vacancies that are impacting upon that, that poor timely, timeliness? No, because... So, Senator Rice, we had quite a long discussion about the numbers before, so perhaps if we just repeat... No, well, this is a different yeah. question, with all due respect, Mr Quinlan. Okay, it sounded like the same no. question Mr. to me. Norton, you said no. No, no. He started to answer. Yes, he started, did start to answer. <laughs> yeah. The assessment of a registration application involves various different parts of the agency. It's not just one person who's a scientist sitting behind a desk. There are administrative people involved, there are legal people involved. Our compliance people are involved. Even our finance and HR people are involved in that mm -hmm. process as well. So, so, so in contributes. terms of the lack of timeliness and the delays, um, what, what do you see in terms of staff vacancies? Where are the critical staff vacancies that have led to those delays? The, the critical vacancies would be in, obviously, my area, which is in registration management and evaluation, and also in our scientific assessment areas. That extends also to external reviewers that we use in areas as well. So we're looking at outsourcing information or assessments for um, human health assessments and environmental assessments as well. So those two areas that you talk about, so what, what are the staff, are they regulatory scientists that are employed in those two areas? Yes, they are, yes. and also administrative staff as well. Yes, but it's the, in terms of doing that registration and assessment and I can't recall what the two areas you just said were. It's back, that's um, regulatory scientists are key in those two areas. Yes, they are. Yes. And so the fact that you've only got a workforce now of, uh, with a usual cohort of around 100 scientists, I think we just heard before that you're currently 82 regulatory scientists. So you're, you're down about 20% on your usual workforce. Is that correct? I'd have to check those numbers in relation to the scientists, the regulatory scientists. Yeah. Okay. So and do you? So you've got you've got those vacancies. So how are you going filling those vacancies? Do you have, expect to be back up to a, a, a cohort of around your hundred within any, within any time soon? Um, Senator, we've undertaken. We've recently concluded uh, a general round that we uh, initiated at the end of last year, which was um, very successful. Um, we've commenced a number of other recruitment strategies, including launching more targeted. Uh, and more aggressive recruitment targeting uh, junior regulatory scientists as well as more experienced people to come into the agency. Uh, we continue to draw upon um, merit lists from other agencies to attract and, and encourage people to come to the agency. And to support the sort of the, the recruitment, we are also developing and near finalising a, um, an accelerated program for regulatory scientists so that the new people that we bring in um, can go through a program of uh, accelerated learning about uh, the, what's needed to be a regulatory scientist and en enable them to perform um, highly at the level that we need sooner. Um, so how many new regulatory scientists have you recruited since um, the big, this financial year, this since financial 2016, year. Since, since the election basically? So since, um, since 1 July, and noting that we had a transfer of five sci regulatory scientists as part of a mogging arrangement. Sorry, as part of? As part of the Department of Health. So we. Uh, uh, had transferred that, that function to our agency, so five officers came across with that. But we've included then that total is, is, is 20 regulatory scientists is, uh, as at 30th of April. And how many of those are ongoing and how many non-ongoing? So of that, uh, of that 20, nine are ongoing and 11 are non-ongoing. Okay. And how many have you lost in that same period of time? For regulatory scientists? Yes. Um, uh, 20. So you're From basically just keeping keeping up. So your your recruitment is only just keeping up with your departures. Uh, in a and, and so it's basically so you're still staying at the 20% um, vacancy rate. Then um, we're still still early days for us through our recruitment. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, um, through those activities, a number of staff have been who are very experienced haven't actually been promoted, so our capability in-house in continues to build um, and our focus is on bringing new talent to the agency yeah, as but, well. But basically your recruitment is only just keeping up with your departures? At this point in time, we're, we're taking steps and seeing good progress. Um, 
I, uh, as part of our ongoing recruitment, including from this week onwards as well, um, we, um, we're pretty confident that we'll continue to attract strong interest in our positions. And of those 20 that you've recruited, the nine ongoing, 11 non ongoing, are you asking them as part of the recruitment whether they are intending to relocate to Armidale? Uh, so all applicants are made aware that we are, and we've made it very public that we're um, transitioning yes, are, to Armidale. Are they being asked that? Um, not at this point in time, noting that we can't compel them, but when the time is right and we, we anticipate that to be toward the end of next year, we'll be asking staff intentions about uh, whether they will be able to relocate. Right, okay. Um, your... Yes, um, so where, where are those regulatory scientists coming from, the ones that you've recruited? Um... Well, they come from a range of different areas. They come from other government departments. They come from the private sector. Um, uh, how many are being of people being recruited from overseas? We have um, one person at the moment who is um, going to commence quite shortly, who is on a visa arrangement. That was a uh, four, five, seven. Yes. Visa. Yep, and, and purely, purely on basis on the basis of that person's regulatory experience and expertise mm. in in the area that we do. But deal they're with. replacing somebody who has left who the organisation shift to Armadale. Who didn't want? Yes, who's left the organisation because they well they may not have been able to. Senator McKenzie, they may There's have a had range of they may have Senator, had family connections, all sorts of reasons as to why they've been established in Canberra. Are, 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 are you are you expecting are you expecting to recruit? further um, <laughs> regulatory scientists on no, 457 visa arrangements? Oh, don't we, we don't have any speci specific intention to do so. But your applications are obviously open to people from overseas to, to make applications. Anyone can make an application. Yep. Right. Is that enough? It's embarrassed. The poor bugger's under pressure. Um, <laughs> this stupid, ridiculous decision by a dopey minister. Now, oh, sorry, the mic's still on. So you've let me. I'd like to move oh, to the the like temporary so in your, your, your temporary yeah. office. So you've got a temporary office um, co-located with DHS. Currently, you've got two staff there. Is that correct? Uh, we will have. Uh, we have gone through a recruitment process at the moment, so we expect those staff to be um, some staff to be starting in early or early to mid June. Um, that premises there at, um, in the DHS office um, at 246 Beardy Street in Armidale. Um, it's a good arrangement in that it allows us um, to access some workstations there, as I said before, to increase that number of workstations um, if that need be. So um, how many workstations have you got there at, currently? Um, at, at the moment um, we have five set aside for ourselves and that, that's based on the fact that we will have, as I said, two um, permanent staff there in the office in Armidale. Um, we expect that a um, number of staff will be travelling up and down to Armidale at different times, including the exec to do work both with the community, other stakeholders there, um, and in relation to um, moving towards our permanent... Um, and, and how many workstations can you, could you expand that to? We could expand that up to um, 15 workstations. Right. And how long is... Have you got a lease arrangement or what sort of arrangement with no, what DHS? We've, um, what we've entered into there is what um, is known as a shared premises agreement. Um, so that means that, that that's a, it's a non-binding agreement, but it's used between Commonwealth departments um, where you can you know, um, ac access other workstations. Um, you basically access that on, on a fee um, for those workstations that's set by the Department of Finance. Um, and so we can basically access those workstations from as, as we need be. So you could access up to 15 on an ongoing basis until you have yes. your permanent yes. Um, that's, office. that's correct, and it, it's, um, it, it allows us quite a lot of flexibility in that we can access those workstations, um, you know, when, and increase the number of workstations, or we can decrease the number of workstations depending on, mm -hmm. on our own needs. And, and how is how is progress with um, the permanent building that you, intends to be established? Um, yes, we've um, at, at the moment um, we're heading towards um, approaching the market in June um, uh, in terms of a two-stage procurement process. Um, out to market, um, which is pretty much a standard um, approach to market that the Commonwealth Government Departments um, utilise. So that will, over the next, um, probably between June and July, um, is when we'll approach the market in terms of a two-stage procurement process to um, ascertain um, uh, what sort of premises out there would um, fit our needs. Um, and look to, I, I understood from previous um, estimate sessions that you're expecting to have to probably have to build a, a new premises to suit your needs. 
Um, that, that, that's what we need to go to the market to determine. Um, there could be a range, there could be a building already existing there, there could be a building that needs um, maybe some refit to it, or yes, the, the third um, piece is that it may need a building okay. to be built from the ground up, but that will be determined through the process. And, of, what's, and what is your expectation as to when that building will be ready to be to move into? Um, our, our expectation is, um, in terms of, in light, in, um, in respect of the relocation planning is that um, that building will be available in, um, in, in the sort of the set first or second quarter of 2019. Right. So around the April, April to June and ready to... And so in, um, until, that, until that stage, you've got, you've got a maximum of, of 15 workstations at your temporary offices? Yeah, that, that's correct. Yes. And in terms of the, the types of staff that are going to be there, do you expect in that temporary building that you will have regulatory scientists based there? Not necessarily. We expect um, that that will well, be not necessarily. Um, so is that yes or no? Um, well, I suppose at, at this point in time, um, our systems, etc., probably don't allow us to have regulatory scientists there at this point in time. Right. So you um, won't have any regulatory scientists until you've got a permanent building. Um, probably hard to say at this point in time. I think that. Um, but you just said your systems aren't going to allow it. That's at this point in time. So that, that's some work that we might do over the next two years to see, you know, if we're able to um, put regulatory scientists there. But I'd say in the main, in, this, in, in the planning at this point in um, time, is to have some administrative staff, some staff that will do mm -hmm. some liaison work, etc. So until that permanent building's there, and it sounds like you will have the vast bulk of your regulatory scientists still here in Canberra, um, is that the case? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, and so they will they will continue to be located at your current premises until then. Yes, that's correct. Right, and then in that period of time, you'll then be determining what ongoing arrangements may be in place for scientists that choose to stay in Canberra, and the the work from home, remote working arrangements that we talked about last time. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And and they in fact won't be permitted to be um, working together in premises in Canberra after that time, will they? Yes, that, that's correct. They'll have to work at, work at home on using remote access. Yes, that's they correct. Continue. And yes, which sounds incredibly inefficient. Um, and do you have any... I mean, I understand you said you haven't um, done your workforce planning, you're not asking staff of their intention until the end of this year, but what is until your... The end, of next, end of next year. Yes, yep. the end of next year. But what's your... Exp do you have... You must have a ballpark expectation of how many um, staff are going to be continuing to be based in Canberra and, do, <coughs> and accessing and working using those remote um, access facilities? You must be planning for that. It's difficult to yeah. say at this point in time. Um, we are, as, as, you, as you've identified, looking at um, new ways. Ideally, we want everyone to move to Armidale in 2019. Yes, but that, but you, un um, you accept that that's not going to happen? Um, we accept that, that that may not happen, um, and hence why we're looking at uh, using technology to enable mm -hmm. access to um, science, uh, regulatory scientists so that we can complement our workforce in Armidale. Yeah. And, but so in terms of the numbers of, of staff that you expect to be accessing that, are we talking about five, 50? It's, yeah. it's still, it's just very early to tell it. Our workforce is changing um, and our recruitment strategies are changing and uh, that, as we go through the transition. So as I mentioned, our workforce is changing. So by the time we, you know, even 12 months from now, we expect it, it may look at, um, different to, to, to what it is, but a lot of that will also hinge on of um, what our, um, you know, what the outcome of our settling so on the, the our business model will look like as well. So, are you currently scoping the, you know, the requirements for that remote access? That's correct. We are. Yes. Yeah. And does and is that does that scoping include a, um, a factor as to how many um, staff are likely to use that? Um, no, not not specifically yes. because that that will be something that will be scalable. Um, so really, what we, what we build there is something that's scalable to the number of people that you know want to access that. that so, that is there a minimum though that you were expect you were in that scoping that you were planning for? Not necessarily minimum. No, um, that, that that's obviously um, some you know um, systems etc. So that I mean, put in place in, to in terms of that. if you're scoping that you you know going out and to you know going out to tender or engaging external contractors to help you design that system, what, what is the, the range of um, numbers that you, were, that, that you were talking about that are in those, you know, those, that's, those scoping documents? Uh, no, they're not. You just told me they're scoping it. 
They've been pretty so, clear that they uh, so It's plan. more. So, this is yeah, so our, our remote working um, policy is under development as part of um, shaping what that will look like for staff who um, we identify as being suitable for remote working from home. Um, but that is linked to um, decisions around our digital strategy as well in terms of the technology that will enable us to, to operate differently in Armidale. And, and finally, um, you also talked about the use of external providers. Tell me more about the use of external providers. To assist through the transition? Mm -hmm. um, th th that's right. So we've um, made a conscious decision to keep our transition team separate from our business as usual operations. Um, we've um, now, and you've met um, Mr Cross, uh, appointed our new uh, executive directors for digital and the relocation operations. Um, the transition team itself is supported um, by a, a number of individual staff, but also okay, so external providers. So um, in terms of our workplace and workforce support, we, we have a, uh, engaged Bull and Bear. Um, in terms of our business model um, design for, for Armidale, we've engaged a consultant there, uh, and, as well as engaging and, and working with um, uh, providers on our digital strategy business okay. case. So the external providers, they're all to do with the, the transition and they're being paid for under the budget allocation of the 25 million. That's that right, correct? Senator, yes. yes. So are you looking at the, um, external providers to undertake core work that you do, particularly to address your vacancies? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, if I may, in terms of addressing vacancies, no, but in terms of looking at external scientific assessments that mm. we do, in terms of um, efficacy, human health, environment, residues and chemistry, those assessment areas. Um, we currently use external providers in those areas and we're looking at other other staff or external providers in those so areas. So are you as increasing well. the use of external providers in those areas? Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, Jason Lutzi, Executive Director, APVMA. Um, yes, for a long time we, do, we have engaged external providers in our scientific assessment areas. Um, for instance, in the um, efficacy area, they currently undertake about 60% of, of our efficacy assessments, and in, um, in, in environmental risk assessment, they undertake about 45% of, uh, uh, of our assessments. We are looking at, at measures to extend the capability um, and capacity of our external assessors. And for instance, in residues, which is a, a fairly specialised area, um, we haven't traditionally used external providers and we're currently piloting um, an external provider. And to, so has the use of external device. providers in those areas, have that increased over, over time? It fluctuates, um, Senator. Um, for instance, um, with the health assessment team, the, um, traditionally most of those assessments were undertaken by the Department of Health. Um, over the last couple of years, um, the Department of Health have ceased to do assessments for us. We've taken some of that, um, those assessments in-house and we've also increased the number of assessments that are done externally. Can you provide on notice of the trends in each of those areas in terms yes. of what's being done in-house and what's being done externally? We can do that on yes. notice. And is there a greater cost for the external provision of these services than if you were doing them in-house? Yeah. Um, that's very difficult at the moment for me to say, Senator. It depends on the sort of assessment that we might do inside and the sort of assessment yeah, we might do outside. But in general, outside. you say it's difficult to, difficult to say, but you must have some idea in terms of your budgeting as to if a, um, an assessment is being done externally compared with internally, what the extra cost is. It depends on the experience of the external assessor and the internal assessor. It, it can vary, Senator. It can vary. Can you just give me, you know, I'll, depending I'll, on I'll provide some of that advice on notice as well, okay. Senator. With Thank the you. Trends. Thank but you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. I 